to you and others who registered but were unable to attend um, after the session is over. So, um, Raman, are you able to uh, bring up the slideshow? I can indeed. Great. So we'll just kind of review the agenda for this evening. Also, Robin and Michael came up with the clever title of the webinar, If I Had a Million Dollars. Um, so the agenda for this evening, uh, we did the welcome. And then we'll invite Michael, who's going to do a presentation on Goldboro LNG proposal, just a kind of broad overview of the concerns um, and why we're opposing it. And then we are hoping to get Margaret Cook on the line, um, who will be providing the Amigma perspective on, on this project. We also have a recording from a German ally who has been working to oppose uh, the Goldboro LNG for some years now. And of course, given timing, it's uh, too late for them to join, but we have a recording to share. Then we'll do a question and answer period. Um, and then afterwards, we'll uh, have a bit of a summary of what we've heard, as well as talking about some actions, taking action collectively as well, um, as well as next steps. So with that, I would like to introduce Michael. Um, Michael Jensen is a technologist who spent a decade as a sustainable farmer outside of Scottsburn, Nova Scotia and is now living outside Tatamagush. He is an activist with our North Shore chapter in, uh, of the Council of Canadians and was heavily involved in the anti-fracking campaign in Nova Scotia as well. Thank you. Uh, let me bring up my... Can you all see that? Good, I'm seeing nods. So yes, I'm Michael Jensen. Um, my goal is to give you some context for this proposal. Um, I want to be clear that the overview represents my conclusions. They don't represent the Council of Canadians necessarily or any other organization that I am associated with. Uh, my hope is to provide an overview and, and just good context on this LMG uh, proposal. And that said, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> it is a really bad idea. Um, the idea is to build uh, a liquefied natural gas plant in Goldboro, Nova Scotia. On the face of it, jobs for the community of a thousand in the region, uh, construction infrastructure for a, a bridge fuel, they like to call it, to clean energy, sending liquefied natural gas to Germany to power a hydrogen producing plant. What's, what's not to like? Well, actually quite a lot. Um, as a business, it's built on a sand mound shaped very much like a pyramid. Uh, and as you'll see in the next few minutes, the business case is bad, the short-term consequences unpleasant, the long-term consequences terrible. Worse, the likelihood is very, very high to my mind that Nova Scotians and all Canadian taxpayers would be left holding the bag. In a request um, that was supposed to be secret, Paraday asked the federal government for great gobs of money, nearly a billion dollars, but ours for the low, low price of only $925 million. Thank goodness this document saw the light of day because the entire project's a boondoggle, a middleman's dream of fabulous profit and a very, very bad idea. It's bad economically, it's bad environmentally, it's bad for us locally, it's a bad choice at this particular moment in humankind's history, and it's a classic white elephant. It is economically bad, Paraday is really quite the loser. Um, at its heyday in, in late 2010, 
when it was selling off another project that it had, it was riding high in Alberta. Its stock sold for $34 a share plus. Today, it's about 34 cents per share. So that's a 99% decline. Um, CEO Alfred Sorensen sold the Kitimat LNG um, project for $300 million in 2010, personally pocketed $30 million in the transaction, according to the Tai uh, article referenced earlier. Paraday today does not look like a viable going concern. Who would invest in this? And why would we entrust Goldborough's future uh, to this so-called company? It's also environmentally bad. Um, such numerous solid analyses show that this could ruin our chances of sustainability in terms of our carbon output, um, matching the Paris Accords. Uh, it, it would lock us into decades of, uh, of an enterprise that shouldn't be going on at all, burning fossil fuels. Um, and the infrastructure impacts uh, would be substantial. I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes, but it is, uh, it's, it's clear to me that this is, this would do the environment no, no favors. Hey, Michael. The problem. Hey, Michael. Yes. I wonder, there's just a lot of background noise on your, yes. if you're, are you shuffling papers or something like that? Oh, it may be my chair. I'll try to sit very still. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, it, I, I, this is locally bad because of the, um, the, the buildup of man camps. Uh, this has happened in North Dakota, Montana, uh, Saskatchewan, um, Manitoba, where they are doing, you know, fracking and oil, oil rigs you just get a, a, these concentrations of well-paid workers living far from home with nothing much to do except um, cause trouble. And so you end up with, a, with, a, with crime waves of, of assaults, robberies, rapes, drunken disorderlies. There's all sorts of short-term disruptions uh, potentially creating um, sort of the, the, the classic boom bust cycle. It is, um, it, it, it's not good for, for society, really. It's also not good for societal infrastructure. That is, um, if you are building up a factory of this, uh, of this type, you're going to be having massive trucks damaging those rural roads, affecting villages all across Nova Scotia and all across other parts of the country. Um, Faraday asked to move a highway. And apparently got permission. We, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not quite certain how that has gone, but um, and it'll 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 encourage pipeline construction, which has its own its own issues. It is also based in this 20th century energy model that uh, is unsustainable globally. At this particular moment, <clears throat> um, solar and wind has become cheaper than fossil fuels. Uh, battery technologies are uh, sort of exploding in in um, in durability and uh, and um, um, volume. The uh, the world is recognizing that we need to respond to these climate issues, and investments are moving away from the fossil fuel, natural gas um, options because they recognize the liabilities. So it's likely that in a few years, the Goldboro LNG plant would be a, uh, a white elephant, something that we can't sell, we can't, um, is senseless to complete, but Paraday still comes out with bucks. So what are the alternatives for jobs? There's a, a wide variety of, of options. Um, this is some, one that came out of the, uh, uh, the EAC, um, Ecology Action Center. Um, this is not the only answer, but it's an example of the kind of work that can be done to produce good work, good jobs, um, uh, uh, to 
improve the economy. So in, uh, in the end, there's no rational reason to support this proposal. It's economically bad, as I said, environmentally, locally, socially bad at this moment. And, and when I say white elephant, um, in Thailand long ago, uh, white elephant was in, giving up white elephant to somebody was a, a mixed, very mixed blessing because it, the recipient had to feed, house, and honor the gift for the rest of the white elephant's life. Um, very expensive. In this context, this white elephant is an anti-gift. It burdens the recipient, Nova Scotia. And the last thing we want is such an arrangement. We don't want to accept this gift. Paraday should not be allowed to profit from the machinations of a well-lubricated industry. Um, I hope that sort of gave us a, a little bit of context. And I'll look forward to hearing other people. Great. Thanks, Michael. And next we have Margaret Cook, who is a Mi'kmaq grandmother and band member of Millbrook First Nation. She is a former executive member of the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association and a formal Royal Commissioner for Aboriginal People. She cares deeply about the environment and Indigenous struggles like missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and wrote an article in the Nova Scotia Advocate about her concerns with Goldboro LNG. Margaret? Hi, uh, making sure you can hear me. <laughs> now we can hear All right. you. Okay, great. What a time getting into this meeting. I'm pretty old school when it comes to doing meetings and stuff. I'm used to sitting around a big table with, with everybody there. But um, I want to thank you for inviting me and uh, for hearing from us grassroots women here in Nova Scotia. I want to make a point of saying that um, Bill C-15, uh, Act that represents the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Our People, you have to have our consent on our Mi'kmaq unceded territory before any development projects proceed. Our women here on the mainland of Nova Scotia, they were never consulted. They were never engaged. They were never informed. This project has been pretty hush-hush and kept under the radar for many years here in Nova Scotia on the mainland. I know I didn't hear about this project until about 2015 and never really paid much attention to it until recently when things started to um, come to light that there would be man camps. Um, my years with the Native women and traveling across all 13 reserves in Nova Scotia and doing the Royal Commission report, um, the main concerns that women always brought up were that they were never consulted in a lot of different projects over the years, over the decades. And um, historically, we have been the leaders of our communities. Our leaders didn't make choices that would uh, affect our lives and our safety. And as you all know, Nova Scotia is a hot spot for human trafficking. This, this place here that they're talking about in Goldberg, it's a small community and they're gonna bring in over 5,000 men from different areas of Canada to live and work there. But the problem we have as Native women is that this little community also borders like within an hour, two hour drive for some of us, some of us even less on the mainland um, to where this proposed man camp is gonna be. Uh, Goldberg, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with the area itself, but it's a, a fairly small coastal community. I think their population's only a couple hundred people. I'm not sure. Like I've, it's been a while since I've been down there. But I know from Millbrook, we're only about an hour, 20 minutes away from where this is going to be. But in Millbrook, we also have right next door to us our neighbors in, in Sipanakity and Shibanakity. Then there's Coal Harbor and and so on. Like th these man camps are a proven heat, uh, proven danger to uh, directly impact the native reserves. And these big projects make a habit of going onto native communities or nearby proximity to these native communities and no regard to their women. Like I know I've worked with um, 
the original Sisters in Spirit campaign and a lot of the concerns that were brought up back then. And that was, I think, in 2004. I might be wrong on the date. But uh, they, they, sorry about that, I got a phone call. But they, too, were working on the missing and murdered ingenious women and girls across Canada. And give, I'll read you a quick fax about that. But Nova Scotia is the highest rate of human trafficking incidents in the country with 2.1 in, in every 100,000 people. Well, Nova Scotia is not that big to begin with. Um, in the final report, the MMIWG and the National Inquiry said that into the violence of my, and uh, widespread violence against ingenious girls and women, that uh, it drew attention to the cl close proximity to big companies like this with the LNG that it directly impacted their lives. It directly put women and girls at risk. These are things that have been proven. These are things that are being ignored here on the mainland in Nova Scotia. We have several um, chiefs in our, in our, on, our res, on our reserves for Nova Scotia. There's 13 chiefs. LNG says that they are working with the Mi'kmaq people and they're in, consult, in consultations and engaging them. And that's completely false as far as I'm concerned because we got 13 chiefs and they they've been, been in talks with two two chiefs do not represent all of us here on Nova Scotia and certainly not on the mainland the chiefs that they've been talking to and uh, I, you know I'm not trying to start a war with our chiefs and then you know all due respect there but the chiefs that they've been talking to are not on the mainland in Nova Scotia and none of the chiefs in Nova Scotia have made any public statements regarding their involvement with this project they say they're going to give jobs to the Mi'kmaq people, that they're going to boost our economy and stuff like that. And I'm going to mind my language, but I call crap on that because these people, the work in these plants, you have to be highly technical people. You have to be skilled laborers. Like the big high paying jobs are going to be somebody within their own workforce that they're going to bring here that have already worked on these projects in other areas. The jobs that they're they're creating or claim to be creating are going to be at best minimum wage jobs for native people cooking and cleaning and uh, in my opinion and a lot of the grassroots women's opinions <sighs> our women are worth more so if get a bit emotional there but um Okay, take your time, Margaret. Our women are definitely worth more than a few token jobs. So that's what, what really upsets me. I mean, anybody can go out and go work at McDonald's and cook and you can go to a hotel and clean, right? But Jesus Christ, sorry. <laughs> that's what they're offering. And that's what, what they're blindsiding our government with. I've been pretty vocal on our um, Mi'kmaq solidarity, solidarity uh, support group with posting facts. And I'm pretty pissed off and I'm pretty annoyed. We've got organizations that are supposed to be representing us and they're not. They're not making any public statements. They're not saying, you know, the dangers and the risk to our women. They're hiding it. They're, they're I don't know if it's because of these slap silly lawsuits that the LNG has got out there because they're known for it. They're known to pull the, the wool over people's eyes. They're not even consultant or Mi'kmaq people. They're not thinking about our rights and the rights of women. And they're not engaging. They're, they're completely and absolutely pulling the wool over the eyes of every Canadian. Um, this isn't going to affect just our Native women, though, you know, we're the most uh, vulnerable. This is our, Nova Scotia is a mixed culture. We've got people living from all over the world here. And uh, it's just disgusting that they can get away with this and that they can keep doing 
stuff like this. Big multi-billion dollar companies that come into little provinces and say, we're going to boost your economy. We're going to give your local people jobs. And, and they know who to reach out to. They know who to engage. Our national organization of women, and this is probably why I'm a bit uh, emotional about this. My mother worked over 30 years of her life fighting violence against Native women. And uh, our national organization that's supposed to represent us women and mandated in their policies about violence against women invited these people to the table at a national summit to end violence against women. To me, that is just absolutely ludicrous. Our local organization, they don't seem to care. They don't seem to be saying, you know, what's their stand against us? And they should be, but it's us grassroots mothers. It's people like Ducey Howe, um, our water protectors, Doreen Bernard and uh, Cheryl Maloney and people like that. These women fight every day for our rights and, and they're the voice of women. And I think they're the real, the real people that should be speaking on this, not, you know, not our organizations, because obviously they're not, elected officials are not representing us here on the mainland where this, where this uh, project is gonna be so horrible for us. Um, I'm gonna read you some cold hard facts about this project. It's gonna be a 5,000 man camp. And I, I say no consent and no community engagement. Um, the job offers will be local high paying technical jobs, you say, but only construction and, and catering services are, are to the Mi'kmaq. You know, that's great when the construction's all said and done. They said it could take up to two, maybe four years to construct this, this monstrosity. Um, they failed. They failed their duty to consult. They, they failed their duty to engage us grassroots women. And uh, they failed us here on Nova Scotia. The doctrine of the duty to consult, I think, uh, should come into play because uh, the United Declarations and the Rights of Ingenu Ingenious People, which was endorsed in 2010, provides that member states must consult and cooperate with us ingenious people on certain matters regarding development on our unceded Mi'kmaq territory. And uh, that's, that says a lot. Your duty to consult also comes into effect with the environmental assessments, regulatory processes, and natural resources that include any decisions regarding pipelines on our unceded territory. Um, how they're getting away with this, I have no idea. I mean, that they're certainly in the right pockets for some people, I say. Um, a lot of people aren't, aren't aware of this, that uh, this project is, is proposing to use a fracking resource. And Nova Scotia banned fracking. Why are we being the middleman? Why is Nova Scotia being the pimp for these guys to bring your frack gas here from another territory or another place where your man camps over there have probably already affected the lives of Native women, but you're going to ship it here to Nova Scotia and then you're going to sell it to Germany. Germany does not care what happens on our small little territories. Germany does not care where you're getting their gas from, obviously, and what the impacts it's having on the environment and, you know, the impossible impacts it's going to have on the people that are being forced upon us. Uh, the Nova Scotia Fracking Association I also looked into, they're clearly against this. The, the, these LNG plants, they said, are notoriously large polluters. When the public became aware of this LNG, merely stated frack gas will not be used in the first phase. Well, anybody with a half IQ can tell you right now in the first phase, yeah, but in the second phase, obviously, because they're going to ship it here. They've been so secretive, they've been so under the wire that it's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, I have also looked into different um, recommendations and stuff that this project has to pull forth. It's called a term poll review process uh, through CAN, that's a government agency. And they recommended that they wanted to see what was gonna be the impact 
of uh, the fisheries in Nova Scotia because of this. What's what's going to happen there? Has the the Mi'kmaq fishery people um, been talked to? No, because I've been looking. At, I'm telling you, I've spent hours and hours and hours of researching all the little things that this company is doing, and they're not. They're absolutely not doing what they say they're doing. They're selling this, they're pulling the wool over people's eyes. And uh, I'm, I'm just disgusted, I really am. I mean, I don't know how, how we can stop this. I don't know who we have to reach out to, but I do know that camp culture is uh, one of the main things that I'm worried about for our ingenious women, our Mi'kmaq women here in Nova Scotia. Camp culture um, has been reported to, um, to escalate uh, mental illness, drug and alcohol abuse, violence, misogyny, racism among the men that live there and work there. They're away from their family, their friends, their social supports. These men, you know, mind you, they work stressful, difficult jobs and potentially dangerous working conditions. Man camps are temporary housing facilities that are constructed and uh, bringing in 5,000 men into a province like Nova Scotia, you bring me a clearance, uh, into a province like Nova Scotia, you know, we suffered a horrible, a horrible um, incident last year. Half of our RCMP police force are off duty with post-traumatic stress disorder. How are they going to protect our women? They're not able to. And I say that boldly, they're not able to. There's no way. Um, I know in our Mi'kmaq communities, our police force are not on duty 24 seven. We have police and agreements in place, but our police here in Millbrook, they're not here. They're not able to be here 24 seven because their police force is stretched out. We live in a human trafficking hotspot. The MWIG final report and Amnesty International and many other reports agree with what I'm saying, and it's not just me, it's our, you know, women that are just finding out about this. We're not consulted, we're not engaged. Like I said, back in 2015, and maybe even longer back to 2008. These man camps are, have been kept quite a secret. They, they dressed it up with jobs, they dressed it up with a boost in the economy. They picked Nova Scotia because, you know, we, we've got a a small, a smaller population. Mm -hmm. They figured they could probably come here and get away with this. But uh, the MMIW final report and Amnesty International agree that man camps are a direct risk to our women and children. These man camps are laid, are located in territories away from cities and often in close proximity to our communities, our Mi'kmaq communities. Our, you know, these bring dangers that we here in, in our little province in Nova Scotia are just absolutely not able to handle and deal with. We need more consultation and that's our, our legal right. Our women, and our, we are protected by rights. We are protected by Bill C-15. We're protected under Article 29. I can list all kinds of things. They had a duty to consult and they failed. Simple as that. And uh, I thank you guys for inviting me to talk. Thank you so much, Margaret. You raised a lot of really important points there. And I don't know if you can see the comments happening in the chat, but you're getting a lot of support from uh, others who are on this call. And I'll just read uh, Dorian Bernard's comment out loud. She writes, we don't need LNG, the head of the snake. We're trying to stop all to gas storage from destroying the water, the belly of the snake, bringing fracked gas up the Maritime Link pipeline, and then the government will open up Nova Scotia for fracking in Windsor Block and Gaze River, Alton Block, where Alton has already explored the gas deposits. Um, and then she writes, Native Women's Association are doing training for safety for the women who will be working at the man camps. We should be keeping our women safe by keeping man camps out of Mi'kmaq. We need renewable energy and transitioning from fossil fuel. We're in a climate emergency. So we'll all in for that, Doreen, and for you, Margaret, for taking the time to share uh, your perspective with us this evening. Thank you. Um, 
So we have one other uh, speaker from Germany. Um, there are some people in Germany who absolutely oppose uh, getting fracked gas from other jurisdictions as well. So we'll hear from Andy Gurohu, which I know I've mangled, but uh, he'll, he'll say it on the recording as well. So he's a campaigner and a consultant for climate and environmental protection, and he's based in Germany. Um, he's supported anti-fracking campaigns in many countries in Europe and saw many established bans and has been working for several years with other campaigners and organizers in Canada to oppose the Goldboro LNG. Sorry, I'm struggling with the audio. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> Screen sharing is easier when share sound. There we go. From the other side of the Atlantic. I'm Andy Georgiou, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to briefly outline the reasons why international and German campaigners join forces with Canadian activists in order to stop the climate hostile and financially risky LNG Goldboro project. Um, why is the LNG Goldboro project a no-go? Well, we do have two main arguments, I would say. Um, one core argument is a climate environmental one. The other core argument is an economic and from a European perspective, um, there's another reason why we want to stop this project. And it has to do with the fact that a lot of European countries have introduced um, outright bans or moratoria with regard to fracking. But at the same time, the same countries don't have any problems with importing frac gas, um, which is for us a no-go. Um, everything we do here is under the slogan, not here, not anywhere. And apart from that, um, we also don't want to import emissions uh, that will torpedo uh, our um, efforts to tackle climate change, but also to fulfill our obligations under the Paris Agreement. So the first question that Angela asked is, where would the gas from Goldboro end up and how is Germany connected to this fight? Before I'll try to answer this, this, uh, these questions, um, let me briefly say that um, despite the fact that gas has been touted as a so-called bridge fuel to a post-fossil future, we do have more and more scientific evidence occurring that in actual fact, fossil gas and in particular liquefied natural gas is a main driver of global warming. And the other thing um, related to new fossil gas infrastructure, and we see this on both sides of the Atlantic, is that a lot of these projects, they do rely on public funding um, and they do risk of becoming stranded assets if we, we are about to walk the talk and, and truly um, tackle global warming by stopping burning fossil fuels, including fossil gas, which has a global warming potential of up to 90 times higher than CO2. Um, so it has a significant impact on climate change as such. Now, coming to the question of where the gas might end up, um, this, is, this is a map showing the existing LNG terminals in Europe, the ones that are uh, proposed, uh, the, the ones that are in construction. And you do see that there are a lot of um, supply chains, some of them coming from Northern Africa, um, more and more U.S. LNG is being imported into the European Union. This has to do with um, uh, um, the trump Juncker deal that was um, finalized in July 2018. Um, and it's also something that we are trying to stop and avoid. As you see, um, so far there are no LNG exports coming from Canada into Europe or Germany, and we want to keep it that way. Now, if we zoom in into Germany itself, there are um, several main projects, um, fossil gas projects um, that are now um, at center stage of the debate. Uh, one of them is the Russian Nord Stream 2 pipeline. 
And the other ones are three proposed uh, LNG import terminals, all of them having a transatlantic perspective, meaning that in, in all three cases, um, there is a high uh, possibility that frac gas will be imported into Germany. All these projects, um, no matter if it's Nord Stream 2 or any of the proposed LNG terminals, face the high risk of becoming stranded, stranded assets. And coming back to Goldboro, um, this, this is also true for any infrastructure project that is directly linked to these projects or to Germany. Um, because not only is Uniper linked um, with Purity, but Purity also relies on a loan guarantee of um, up to 4.5 billion US dollars from the German, uh, from the German government to co-finance the LNG Goldboro project. And, and this, is, this is on the table, this is part of the debate since 2013. So for over eight years, Purity tried to get a loan guarantee from the German government and on the website, they're saying that they've already received this in principle, uh, but in actual fact, through parliamentary requests and also through um, freedom of information requests that I personally put forward, we found out that the only thing that exists from, from the German side is a letter of intent. So there's nothing more than um, a letter basically saying, we will think about giving you the loan, um, and, and for me personally, this is, this is something completely different than having some kind of loan guarantee in principle. Now, coming back to Wilhelmshaven, as I've already said, this one is off the table. And the reason for that is not only the strong opposition that um, we were able to, to uh, mobilize and organize on the ground, but also because of the meager response of the market uh, when Uniper um, started the, the, the open season procedure and, and basically asked the market if there's any interest in buying capacities. And there was not enough interest. In actual fact, we, we, we've sent them a letter of disinterest um, before the procedure um, ended and apparently the market responded more or less the same. So Uniper is now thinking of um, uh, rather creating a green hub uh, in particular for hydrogen in, in Wilhelmshaven. Now, the next question I was, uh, I've been asked is what are the people doing in Germany to oppose LNG? Well, we do have, of course, on a daily basis, we do have uh, the whole list of, of things that you can do, starting with petitions, open letters, uh, official statements, participation in public consultations, uh, lobbying your politicians, uh, putting pressure on them, in, trying to, to outline the, the main arguments either through webinars or, or public events. This was, of course, before COVID, but we, will, we were also able to, to organize some um, actions on the ground um, in, in different federal states and in Berlin, because we, we do have different uh, federal states involved. And we will definitely continue to do so um, until all the proposed LNG import terminals in, in Germany are off the table. And I personally and all the others involved, uh, including a bigger German NGO who is also part of the anti-LNG uh, Goldboro campaign, we will also continue to work with the Canadian partners in order to make sure that this zombie project is off the table once and for all. One last question that I was asked is what does the new um, German High Court decision uh, with regard to, to climate um, means for this struggle? Well, for those of you who, who are not familiar with the case, um, a German top court uh, recently um, decided um, that the key climate legislation is insufficient uh, in Germany. And the reason for that is that it, it basically um, uh, poses a threat for future ge generations, so to say. And, and um, it also calls for the German government to have much more ambitious climate targets. And as a direct result, German government now recently announced that um, they might aim for a 60% uh, CO2 emissions reduction by 2030, which is very ambitious. And the reason for that is that we are already uh, we failed to achieve our 2020 targets, um, 
any new fossil gas infrastructure that would be put in place um, torpedoes the already existing targets. And if we do have even um, more ambitious targets, this uh, would definitely mean that any kind of imports of, of fossil gas uh, from Canada um, would, would not fit in, into our overall obligations. Finally, I can only say that together we can do it and let's stop LNG Gold Pearl once and for all. Thank you. Great. Um, so many thanks to Michael and Margaret, as well as Andy for the vital information on this proposal. Um, I do see a few comments and questions coming up in the chat, um, but before we get to the question and answer period, I did want to recognize that there are a few people on the call who've been involved in this fight for several years. Uh, that includes Jim Emberger, as well as uh, Ken Summers. And so um, maybe just to give a bit of space to you both to see if there's something key that hasn't come out in the presentation so far that you think uh, would be good for, for everyone on the call to hear. Um, and I see also Catherine, for example, has asked a quick review of what's been permitted so far. Um, so Michael or Jim or Ken might be well suited to respond to that question as well. Jim or Ken? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Ken might be the uh, one to talk about what's been permitted uh, so far there because he's been on top of that for some time. Ken, are you there? <laughs> be on mute. Um, Ken Summers, just for everyone's information, has been uh, involved for several years in researching uh, the project, but also the um, he was involved in the no frack steering committee in Nova Scotia. Um, I think Ken actually just dropped off. Ah, okay. He often has problems with his connection. No, no. Well, uh, let me speak to something at the other part of it then just to uh, uh, give people an idea of, uh, you know, you're not, Nova Scotia is not in this alone. And you've heard uh, from the, uh, from Andy from, from Germany, and there are several groups over there, big, big NGOs uh, who are uh, involved in this campaign, but also because this project spans Canada, uh, the gas is supposed to come at first from Alberta. And so there are groups out in Alberta who are now, in opposition to what's happening out there is Pure Day is trying to get um, uh, licenses to, to operate uh, leases that the Shell gas is trying to get rid of because they're crummy, <laughs> crummy it's a lot of uh, sour gas uh, licenses from old fields that are running out uh, and a lot of environmental connections with that. So there is a big battle going on there. And if sort of our side wins, that could stop the whole project in its tracks out there. So that's one hopeful sign. Right now they're in hearings before the, uh, the Alberta regulator. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the project would require pipelines you know, across the country, particularly through Quebec. And, uh, and Quebec has long been you know, an opponent of, uh, of shale gas and, and pipelines especially. And so there's quite an active opposition in Quebec uh, surrounding the, uh, the pipelines. And then here in New Brunswick, we're not as directly affected, but we were originally listed in, in Pier Day's original plans as uh, one of the sources to get gas here before, before we had the moratorium passed. <clears throat> so uh, our moratorium is very uh, fragile and we know it could be lifted in a minute if somebody with a lot of money came along and uh, you know, talked to the right people in government. So we're involved in it too. So you have, you have groups all across the country that are uh, uh, involved in this now fighting it on many levels, uh, both in public in terms of uh, publicity and uh, uh, pointing out the, uh, the facts of the case, um, but also there's, there's a lot of potential legal roadblocks that can be you know, thrown up uh, to, to put stop this in a track. 
but um, it's important to do what we're doing now, like with this group here, to particularly get the people who are on the ground at point zero, you know, ground zero, to uh, to be aware of of what's going going on there. Uh, not to make you think there's anything hopeless, but to just get everybody riled up, essentially, uh, because you know that's where the battle may probably be the first place it will ensue. And um, mm. thanks, I Jim. Think, I, sure. I think Ken's back online, maybe. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's back online. I'm not sure if he can speak or not. Ken. Um, but he did write in the chat that Paraday has all the permits it needs for the LNG plant, but we are challenging a couple of those. Robin, was there anything you wanted to add to that? And then we'll open up the space for more questions. I think Ken got it, but if anyone has more questions, we're here to take them. So maybe just use the raise hand function or type in the chat um, that you have a question you want to speak out loud, or you can actually type the, the question in the chat as well. So Ken is adding that Paraday owns the former Shell gas field assets in Alberta, but it does not have the operation licenses yet. It is and is at risk of not getting those from the Alberta Energy Regulator. Yeah. Annette, I saw your hand, so I unmuted you. Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Um, I remember the first time I heard about this project, which sadly was only about um, maybe a year and a half ago. And um, the first report I saw in media was about how a Mi'kmaq company was partnering to provide services and so on. And so for allies, it, it kind of created this immediate challenge of, oh, um, you know, we are we going to be taking away Mi'kmaq jobs? So, um, you know, clearly they did a good uh, greenwash on this one or not. Anyway, the media bought it uh, is what I want to say. And so it, anything we can know about the company, like it says a Mi'kmaq company or companies will be engaged for catering and services. Um, anything we can be told about that would be helpful. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tanette. Margaret or um, anyone else, do you have further information on that? Margaret, you're on mute. Looks like you're speaking. I think she's referring to the Black Diamond Group. It's supposed to be 51%. Mi'kmaq own, but it's quite a mystery oh, as to who actually who actually owns this group for the the catering service. Um, Jackie. You're on mute. Here we go. All right, thank you. So uh, thank you so much for uh, for doing this tonight. I am um, I am saddened that having missed this completely to a friend in Ontario wrote to me. My question is, is there a um, is there just a sheet, a timeline, something that would help all of us have information on sort of what stage this proposal and project is at? So are there actual existing agreements with the provincial government or the federal government at this point? Has land been expropriated or stolen yet? Um, 
has there been any kind of debate in the Nova Scotia legislature? Well, there haven't been much debates about anything during COVID, but has there any been any kind of discussion um, in in uh, environmental committees in the legislature regarding this? Um, so, I'm, is is there a is there a, a a campaign that is occurring on a province wide basis? So. I, so I say all this with a great deal of humility, being in complete ignorance of what's been happening. Sure, thanks for the question, Jackie. Ken, maybe, or Michael, yeah. Well, this has sort of come to a head fairly quickly for m many of us, me included. And we're still gathering information and we're still looking for who, who the right partners are and the allies. This is bringing together several of them. Um, I, I, there's also a really good uh, summary article that Robin and Angela put together for the Council of Canadians. Did you put that in the chat already, Robin? Yeah, okay. So, um, which is a good summation, but we need more information and we're gonna need to have activists engaged in finding out this sort of stuff because that's that's how we build the, the movement of opposition that you're describing. I wonder if Ken knows more than we do about the particulars of what's been approved by whom. <laughs> I don't know if oh, Ken's saying in the chat. Um, we have the option to challenge the recently granted approval for the road that is to go around the plant. So there was recently an, uh, an environmental assessment approved for um, moving a piece of the highway to facilitate this project. But because that um, is so new, he is, we are collectively able to challenge that approval. Um, but for the most part, most of the permitting and approval stuff that happened with the environmental assessment for the project as a whole, that all happened a long time ago. And it looks pretty dubious because a lot of it was done when the project was quite different. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to deal with that because the project that was approved doesn't look a lot like the project that's being pushed ahead now. So we're we're uh, in the process. Jackie, I don't know if that answers your question. It's it's a difficult one. So if you have follow up or want more details, you can type it in or ask a, ask another question. You're still on mute, Jim. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I kept getting the message that said you wouldn't unmute me. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, I was hitting the button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, just real, real quick, because somebody asked about schedule, and, and uh, uh, in, in one minute or less, uh, you know, this has been going on, as people pointed out, since like 2013, and, uh, and many years between then and now, uh, Pier Day was supposed to make a final investment decision, okay? But every year it gets put off, because the whole thing is a house of cards. If one little thing goes wrong, you know, everything goes down the tubes. And that's why you have these things that you're hearing about, like these uh, sort of uh, real things that aren't really real. <laughs> you know, uh, like an agreement with the Mi'kmaq is, uh, well, it sort of is some kind of agreement, but, you know, we don't really know what it was or specifics. But it's something that Pier Day can show up to the German government saying, look, you know, we're being careful about Aboriginal rights. OK, the same thing with they tell the people in the Canadian government, oh, the German government's promised us four billion dollars when the German government really didn't do that and actually had to tell Pier Day to stop talking like they really had a loan. Now they're saying the same thing to the German government about, oh, we're going to get a Canadian loan for a billion dollars. So it's this it's this trading off of wheeling and dealing because they've got all these uh, apples in the air that they're juggling. And if any one of them falls, it'll do it in. And so real quickly, just so out in Alberta, that's going to go probably to public hearings about there. If that goes our way, they're dead. In Quebec, 
they just, it looks like they're going to nix another problem in Sagmore. It was very much like the Pure Day uh, uh, LNG thing. And it looks like Quebec's going to say no to that. And then as Ken pointed out in the chat, and this is what I'll end with there, is that uh, uh, we've been working with EcoJustice, who just sent out a really uh, compelling uh, brief to the uh, federal government about how the uh, the whole project needs a federal uh, uh, environmental assessment. And so, you know, that goes our way. That's going to set them back a couple of years that will almost definitely kill the project. So, mm -hmm. so it's a big thing, but there are a lot of little parts where we can stop it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jim. Robin? Yeah, I'm going to jump in here because one of the questions a few minutes ago in the chat was, is the billion dollars that Paraday has asked for in the bank or is it not? And the answer is that it's absolutely not. <laughs> it's a ridiculous amount of money to ask for. And the government has not yet said yes. So we have some time and we've been doing a lot of work alongside Jim and Ken and all the other people who have been working on this for ages. We've been doing work to put pressure on MPs um, to say no to that billion dollar financing request. And there's actually a handful of MPs, mostly all in Nova Scotia, who have been lobbied super heavily by Perry Day um, to build their support for that billion dollar financing request. But we've been pushing back to get those specific MPs who were kind of in the middle of this to say no to that outrageous <laughs> request. And so, so far, um, as far as I know, other organizations and other people are doing work too, but so as, as far as I can tell, 5,013 people have sent letters so far right. to um, Finance Minister Christian Freeland and then a handful of other MPs in Nova Scotia and the Atlantic who have been lobbied on this issue. And letters are good, but phone calls are better. So I'm going to get Jerry. I think Jerry is with us now. Yep, right here show us how to make a phone call. I just seen a quick question, which MPs, and I can prattle them off for you. Sean Fraser, Halifax West. Uh, no, I can't prattle them off. I'll look at my list, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Regan was one. Jeff Regan is Halifax West, I apologize. Sean Fraser is Central Nova. Mike Kellaway is Cape Breton Canso, which is where the project is. Bernadette Jordan, South Shore St. Margaret's. She's also the Finisheries Minister and Sean Casey, who's the MP for Par uh, Charlottetown. Those MPs have been directly and relentlessly lobbied um, to get on board with this billion dollar request. And we are trying to relentlessly hound them to not get on board with it. So Jerry, please take it away and show us, show us how to make a phone call right now. We're gonna have fun folks. Um, I'm about to put something in the chat, uh, a link that's going to be a tool you can all, uh, those of you who can see the chat, please click on that link. And this is something we're going to do that's going to be a little bit new in a webinar. We're going to get active and phone some of these MPs or possibly Christia Freeland. So uh, does everyone have a phone? If you don't, grab one. Got mine handy. So um, you should, if you click on that link, you're going to see uh, this is a, it's called dial to ditch fossil fuel subsidies, call your, call your MP. So if you, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is click there and put your name, your first name, your last name, your email address, your phone number and your postal code. And what this program, what this site will do is allow you to, it, it will connect to your phone and allow us to know how many people have contacted the MPs as, as or, or uh, Christian Freeland as part of this campaign. So please yeah. take a moment. I'm not and seeing the link. It's in the chat. Oh, I'm putting it in again uh, right now. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. So I'll give you all a minute to put in your name, email address, phone number, and postal code. The postal code is particularly important because that will direct you to uh, a, a, a politician who might be local to you, if that's possible, if there is one. If anyone's struggling, let me know.
How often do you get to take direct action in the middle of a webinar? It's not every day. All right. So next steps, once you've got all those filled out, is that there you'll see the big uh, bold letters down below, make the call. But I would ask you, if you're not already muted, to mute this uh, webinar that we're in so that we're not all hearing you making phone calls at the same time. I'm going to make my phone call. Can I just interrupt? I'm sorry before Certainly. you do that. For all of us who are in Cumberland, Colchester, is it really worthwhile for us to be calling Lenora, or we should be better calling Sean Fraser. Uh, Sean Fraser is much better. So, okay, so we need to put somehow, not ours, our postal code, but if someone could right. just give a Sean. Here, I'll number. just, uh, I'll pop Sean Fraser's phone number in the chat as well. Great point, Catherine. Um, Thank you. Uh, do you have a postal code? Yeah, postal code. If they could punch in their postal code, uh, that will reach Sean Fraser. Right. I think that's quite complicated. If you want to phone Probably. Fraser and he's not your MP, I just put your phone number in the chat and I'll let you in on a secret that we've asked Sean Fraser for a meeting about six times in the last week and a half. And even though he can find the time to meet with Perry Day on several occasions, he has not found the time to answer our freaking phone calls. So um, uh, we'll call even if he's not your MP. Because he's so guys for a postal code. Is Someone B just posted zero. one. B2G2 L1. Oh, interesting. I've got B0H1N0. They probably both work. Put Ooh. them both in and you, you folks can use that to, um, to get Sean. Right. Personally, I'm looking forward to, to bugging Christia Freeland. Here, Jerry, you make your phone call now. Okay, I'm going to mute and, and everyone go for and, it. And Deuce, Deucey was raising her hand. You have to unmute, however. <laughs> Deucey, go ahead. You. Oh, I just wanted to add something because it was brought up, uh, I think, by Tynette earlier. And uh, I think that if we're going to be, uh, I see Angel Moore here and somebody else, but if we're going to be putting out any kind of public statements, that I think that it should be made clear that uh, I, as a Mi'kmaq woman and a title holder and rights holders in this territory, all of it was not uh, consulted. And I do not consent because if that because that company is owned by supposedly 13 chiefs does not mean that uh, I have been consulted and they're they're circumventing you know their charter you know in the Canadian Constitution and they shouldn't be allowed to do that they they keep doing it all the time but that's one of the reasons why Alton gas had to go back to court because it was proven that they did not consult fairly and it's the same similar situation right now with this company. So Thanks, uh, that's important to put out there with the, all of this information too, because if people think that, oh, we're in agreement and, and we're participating and we're accepting their uh, $720 million uh, letter of uh, you know grant money to run that, that's what it said in that article that uh, Pedigree, the company, has uh, uh, pledged $720 million to that Black Diamond uh, Mi'kmaq company. You know, and, and it's not that uh, we want to be fighting amongst ourselves against our own chiefs, because we don't. That's an old tactic by this government to divide and conquer, and we can't keep taking that route. It's not just... Uh, you know, all looking at our our chiefs or 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 chiefs under a private corporation and what they're doing. You know, it it's uh, all levels of government that's involved in this too, and we need to keep that in mind. But what is important is it, it's against our rights, our constitutionally entrenched rights, to be consulted. And I, for one, can declare that I was not consulted in any way and I do not consent and I'm pretty sure Ann Wood and Brooke and Doreen but you know that's what that means you must consult with all not just a few 
it doesn't count that way. It doesn't cut it. And that needs to be put out with this information so that people don't think that we're in a, we're all in agreement. You know, sometimes people think that uh, we're all, we're all alike and we all think alike and we're all environmentalist and we all love the land. <laughs> we don't, we're, you know, some of our people are colonized just like everybody else, you know, and to expect them all to be environmentalists is just not realistic. You know, we have to deal with different perspectives and, and, and different ways people think too, even in our own communities. But yeah, so I just wanted to say that if there's any pub publicity coming out of here, that need, that's what needs to be said to, to so that people aren't shying away thinking that we're, we're in agreement because we're not. We're, we are totally against this and we want this to be stopped, you know, and Anyways, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Susie. Okay, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, below the call button, there's a script if you need help in what you're going to say. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks, Ducey, and everyone who's spoken up and asked questions and offered their perspectives and thoughts. Um, I, it's almost 8.30, so I just want to wrap us up a little bit. And I was given the task to give a little tiny summary of what we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. So I'll try to do that <laughs> now. What I've heard people say tonight, and I mean, many of the things I've read before this, there's a couple main points that we can walk away from this conversation with. One is that I just want to directly quote what Marjorie was saying, or Margaret rather, sorry, I apologize. Um, our women are worth more than this. I'm walking away with that really powerful quote. Um, we also heard from uh, our friends in Germany that he called this a torpedo for the climate. This is an absolute no-go in terms of taking climate action. This is also not a job creator for Nova Scotia. It's a very inefficient way to create jobs when there are many other more responsible and um, socially beneficial ways to create jobs here where we live. And like Michael was saying, this is a white elephant in that it's, it's dressed up like a gift but in reality, this LNG project is a curse. So those are the big, those are the big takeaways in terms of what I'm thinking about Goldboro LNG right now. And I wanna thank everyone for um, your time tonight and for participating and making a phone call to uh, the MPs that have been lobbied by Perry Day. It's despicable in my opinion that our representatives are willing to make time for this massive corporation to talk about getting a major subsidy, but they somehow can't find the time to pick up the phone um, or answer some of our calls. And so I want to tell us a little bit, tell everyone a little more about what we have planned uh, for the next couple of weeks and months. So one thing that we do know about Perry Day is that they have an agreement with a company in, Ger in Germany called Uniper that Uniper is requiring Paraday to have a um, financing agreement worked out before the end of June. We know that this company does not have a financing agreement worked out. They have never had a single investor of any kind, and they're asking the Canadian government to be that primary investor. So if we can put pressure on our politicians, specifically those folks I listed who are being heavily lobbied by Paraday, um, if we can put pressure on them by the end of June to not give that money, we have a good chance of seriously disrupting uh, the Goldboro LNG project from going ahead. So in the next few weeks, we have a few things planned to, um, to keep that pressure on. So next week we have, and when I say we, I, I mean um, the Council of Canadians and a number of our chapters and friends, we have some meetings scheduled with some MPs um, in Nova Scotia. We're still waiting on a meeting with Sean Fraser. So if anyone is his constituent and wants to make a phone call, that would be super beneficial. We do have a few meetings planned next week to um, bring this conversation straight to our representatives. And next week, what we're going to ask from you all, uh, we have your emails and stuff because you signed up for this webinar. We're gonna be sending you an email a couple times next week to ask you to make a phone call to a particular MP in advance of a meeting that we have planned. So for example, on 
Friday, I believe, we have a meeting with Andy Fillmore in Halifax. So it would be great if the folks on this call could pick up the phone and say, hey, Andy, I know you have a meeting with the Council of Canadians later today. I want you to know that I agree we should not be giving money to Perry Day. Um, and then we'll do that for a few folks who we have meetings with. Uh, so that's going to be the next couple of weeks. And then in June, um, it's very hard to predict the future at this particular time. We don't know if we're going to be allowed to leave our homes. We don't know if we're going to be allowed to gather in public. But in June, we're planning to do um, another set of action. We're not sure exactly what that will look like yet. So we're open to ideas, but we're hoping to expand beyond Nova Scotia and work with some, some groups and people across the country to be putting pressure on the federal government to reject this financing agreement. So that's what's coming next. Um, and I think, I think that's all I have to say and I'll turn it back to Angela. Yeah, well, and uh, just to wrap up, I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who has joined here this evening, especially to Margaret and Michael, uh, and also to Andy who uh, shared the video from Germany, Karina and others who have shared uh, a lot of important information in the chat, like Jim and Ken, Thank you all so, so much for being here. We will keep in touch about this issue and continue to do the actions as Robin uh, mentioned. And now that we're learning all of this information and building relationships, then we can continue to work together uh, to stop this project from going ahead. So thank you everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Thanks everyone.